this data science education webinar session today. Um, this webinar is being made available through the Concord Consortium, which is a nonprofit educational technology laboratory based in Concord, Massachusetts, and Emeryville, California. We started these webinars because last February, we brought in over 100 thought leaders from organizations around the US and six continents in Berkeley to lay out the first steps in data science education. What we're doing now is working to continue that momentum through our webinar series, and we're very passionate about the next steps in this revolution. You can learn more at our website at codap.concord.org. And I'd like to introduce you to today's presenter, Cliff Connell of SRRI Education. Dr. Connell is the director of SRRI, and he heads the Statistics Education Research Group. Since 1989, he has directed numerous research and developmental projects, both at, the, at UMass and at Turk. And Cliff will be leading our discussion today, which is entitled, Modeling as a Core Component of Structuring Data, based on an upcoming article that we shared with you this week. Uh, we will be recording this webinar, and we will be making it available after the event. We'll email you details about it through Eventbrite after the fact. And I'd just like to say about this webinar is we love hearing from you. You can record your questions, your notes, and reflections in a Google Doc, which I'll share. And the link to the doc will be posted in just a minute. I'd also like to emphasize that the format of this webinar is participatory by design. Um, Cliff and I talked about it in advance, and we really want you to feel free to interrupt him or work with him and do whatever you would like to do to decide on the conversations and connections and activities that we want to discuss. Cliff will explain what that means in more detail in just a few seconds. And again, for those of you just joining us, welcome to our webinar. Our speaker is Cliff Connell of SRI Tech uh, Education. And Cliff, I'll let you go ahead and take it away from here. All right. Well, I just want to make sure, Bill, did you want to say anything? No, I think uh, you should just go ahead. I should just go ahead. Okay, um, let's see. I want to uh, I want to share my screen, uh, but I'm suddenly not being able to see my share screen button. There it is. Okay, can all of you see uh, is that now screen sharing? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, you bet. For, for, for those of you uh, uh, Christians and with religious training, you, you recognize, uh, I think, the allusion to the beginning of John in that title and the beginning with the case. If you don't, I won't explain it beyond that. But um, today we're going to be... Uh, okay, there's the next one. Um, talking about uh, the research that went into this article that uh, some of you uh, have read. And uh, I want to just give a little bit of additional background uh, to what motivated this research and then summarize what I see as the, the major findings. Uh, and then uh, have an open discussion about some of the issues. But during, um, just emphasize again that during this presentation, please uh, interrupt. And I can't see most of you, so you're just going to have to speak up if you want to interrupt. Uh, and I, I'd uh, prefer that. I love to be interrupted, uh, well, by other than relatives. Um, these uh, are just some of the discussion topics that, for the end that, um, that at least I thought could be interesting. Uh, if you have some other uh, topics for discussion that you'd like to propose, I think you, you could uh, propose them later or even enter them into chat as we go along. And I'll put these up again after, uh, after I do some background. Um, this, this particular research started in a prior 
project that Bill and I collaborated on called the Data Games Project, where we were um, developing uh, computer games that uh, the design of them was intended to require that in order to get better at the game, uh, that people, uh, students would need to analyze data from the game. And uh, I just thought I'd, I, I'd show you, if, for those of you who haven't seen this one such game, um, this was a game called, uh, uh, or is a game called Chainsaw. And uh, the objective of this game is to try to cut these logs to length, uh, to that target length, uh, in a minimum amount of time. So I'm just going to play one uh, game here. So uh, I cut 11 acceptable pieces that are you know, within close tolerance for that target length and the other, the other ones I failed at and here is data within um, that, that sort of a graph that shows me the data. But I can also look at the table and you notice that I, I just played one game in each of the logs here or each of the sections. I can consider a case and I've got information about each of those cases exact length or whether it's uh, too long or too short uh, and up here are, are uh, is information about the game let me just tab back here um, here is here is data from four games Uh, and again, this is as the data are displayed in CODAP. And, and because I've got data at two levels, sort of at the game level, a summary of the number of accepted pieces, and down here, the individual pieces level. So very quickly in the data games project, we, uh, it was just the nature of games that we were always generating data at at least two levels, sort of the game level and then moves within the game that we uh, decided to host these data in this what kind of hierarchical structure for two levels. And um, sorry, I'm having trouble with my control. We, in, in, prior, in our prior work in developing both Tinkerplots and Fathom, we, we used just flat tables, and, which is rather conventional in uh, data tools uh, where each row uh, is a, an attribute and each, sorry, each row is a case and each column is a separate attribute. And we discovered uh, various problems that, that both new and experienced users had with understanding really the uh, implications of using a flat table. And I uh, gave some examples in the article, but let me just give you another example. Uh, we were down working in a teaching workshop down in Nashville where uh, teachers had gone out in the morning into uh, a nature reserve and recorded uh, the types of uh, trees growing in various sections in this uh, preserve. Uh, and these are data from that were collected from one such group. Uh, in the form that they collected it. Uh, so four types of trees in three areas and uh, little hash marks as they collected them and they totaled them up. And then they came back into the, uh, the lab and entered the data into tinker plots. <clears throat> uh, and this is how they entered the data, just basically copying it pretty much as they did from their collection sheet. And then when they went to make a graph, they saw four trees. And so, you know, they get very confused. Wait a minute, I've got hundreds of trees. Where are all the trees? 
And uh, again, this is a kind of problem we saw over and over again, where even these were new users, but even experienced users had somehow uh, used the tool for, for a year or two and not quite understood the convention that cases are supposed to occupy rows. And here they've sort of built a summary table. So g given the problems we are experienced with students using data structures and tinker plots, we thought we maybe were in for even a, a nightmare when we started to uh, introduce them to even a more comp, what seemed to us to be a more complicated structure, these hierarchical structures. So that, that was a real motivation for this reason, was to um, uh, explore uh, a bit what students understood by data uh, and especially how they how they organized and recorded data in a fairly complex situation and to to do that study we developed this uh, traffic scenario uh, and this this was the this was the data the two data sh uh, displays that we showed or not data displays but um, uh, the data itself that we wanted them to record, and this depicts traffic moving along two segments of, uh, of highway and information about ve various vehicles, including the, whether it's a truck, car, or uh, SUV, the speed uh, of that vehicle, the distance between that vehicle and the vehicle in front, uh, and traveling on two lanes, either east and westbound at particular times. So we wanted to include uh, a lot of information uh, in the hopes that we would really test the limits of students' ability to record all this information in a way that they could answer general questions that city planners might have about data or about traffic moving along these highways. Any questions yet? Can you all hear, can people hear me? Can I hear something? Yeah, I have a quick question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, this is Mimi Recker, hi. Um, yeah. One of the things uh, I noticed is, and you showed the, the data for the games, is that's in a, and it's a confusion I've noticed a lot with students, it's the long versus wide format. You know, so we work a lot with students who are collecting data from, L, uh, from sensors, and it comes in as, as a time stamp. And uh -huh. so, you know, that's and, uh, as opposed to a case. And so they have to, in their minds, translate it from this long format where you have a time stamp to the short format, which is person X made these kinds of actions. Does that make sense? And that was a real, uh, I, I see a lot of confusion in that kind of thinking among students. Um. So I'm uh, uh, say say more. Well, maybe you can come back to that because I'm okay. uh, I, I have a, at least a couple interpretations of what you indicated. But certainly, all of us who have worked with with uh, data ourselves um, deal with the problem of getting data in a form that doesn't fit our <laughs> the conventions of the tool we're using. We have to kind of exactly uh, yeah. figure out how to work with it and. Uh, and understanding that there's a problem at all is is the first step. Um, we've had a lot of people who come to us and the data are displaying as they wish and they, they think that there's a command or a menu item that will display the data correctly. So they don't they don't even understand that there's a there's a structural problem that they've got to solve rather than a, a you know a usability problem with the software itself. I think Mimi's uh, question may uh, relate to uh, Chris Hancock's article from the early 90s, where he had students recording data in a uh, in um, tabletop, and they were recording kids' heights, and they record the boys in one column and the girls in another column. Um, and that, in my mind, is an example of the wide format. And whereas tabletop couldn't handle, couldn't do a nice comparison of the boys and girls, and they had to 
figure out how to restructure their data so that they had one column of gender and one column of height. So there is some prior yeah, research. It, it's, and it's the same problem as this tree problem, really. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and there, depending on the tool, there are some tools, like I'm thinking of StatCrunch, seems to be able to handle both forms. And so I think it yes. goes back. Yes. And and goes we back. actually... We actually eventually uh, built into Fathom the ability to handle both forms, at least in limited situations. Mm -hmm. But maybe we should come back to the wide versus uh, yeah. tall uh, later. Yeah, let's, uh, let's go on. Um, so we, uh, we did, uh, we, we, we collected data in sort of two different formats. One where we interviewed people as they, uh, as they created it. So the task, by the way, was to, again, on a sheet of paper, to uh, basically record all of the information that was available on these two snapshots in a way that city planners could answer various questions about traffic flow in that city. And uh, then we sort of analyzed the data sheets that students made uh, and most of them were in a questionnaire format where we didn't interview them um, just analyzed the data sheets and 22 of them we interviewed and sort of probed to had them talk aloud as they produced these data sheets um, and the sort of the the foci of our analyses is we basically wanted to try and develop some kind of taxonomy of the constructs and structures that novices use to, to organize these data. Um, describe sort of the category and categorize the elementary components of these structures and, and try and explain the, the choices novices uh, made. We, we thought in particular in the interviews that we'd see students sort of recognize some limitations of their initial structure and really wanted to, to sort of see how they came to understand what those problems were and how to solve them. Um, our broader motivations, and I've alluded to some of these, was to kind of identify some starting points for the development of more formal knowledge and skill of, of using data structures, uh, and especially to apply any findings that we had to how we designed these, this hierarchical structure in CODAP, or whether we even used it at all. Uh, and to provide a further basis for research on a skill that we really think in the field of data science is becoming increasingly important. That we imagine sort of very large data sets. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> I'm just glad it wasn't me. Uh, <laughs> this, this capability of sort of handling data uh, is really becoming a much more critical skill. And there was virtually no research on this kind of uh, issue. So this was, a, for us, we hoped a beginning point of research into student understanding of data structure. Um, so we, uh, Bill and I, were involved in this research and we for years had, had basically claimed that the idea of case was really fundamental to data. Um, but we, we couldn't quite agree. We knew what a, we could point to a case and say that's it, but we had a very hard time agreeing on a, a, a general definition of case. And so one of the things, the early parts of this research was trying to get clear in our own mind what we meant in general by a case. Um, and we came up with this very uh, short definition, finally, uh, after a year or two of working on it. Uh, by case, we mean the physical record of one repetition of a repeatable observational process. And um, we could, I think, stop right now, if we wanted to, and talk about what we mean by this, and, and uh, we, we could have a very interesting discussion. Uh, and we maybe can come back to this, but let me just point out that a couple of important things in this very short definition that for us, a, 
a case is not the real thing in the world. It's the physical record of some event or phenomena. So the actual, the thing on the paper or the recording is what we're talking about the case. And at least with data, um, there's always uh, more than one or you don't really have data. So this repetition um, is an important part of the idea of case. Uh, and cases come from some observational process. That is, when we decide we're going to collect data, we have to kind of decide how to measure something, uh, how it is we're going to turn some physical thing into a physical record of it. And so we have to develop this observational process that we, that we impose on the world uh, and repeat that over some unit that we recognize uh, over and over again. So for us, then, a case is, is a result of this um, decision to uh, observe something in a certain way over and over again. Good. Can, yeah. you, can you talk a minute about, so one of the things that I've seen with students and most people, especially when looking at the graph, they see data points. And, and I know that, you know, those of us who talked a lot about you know, working with Kodak, we think of that representation of a point as being, like a dot on the graph as actually being a case, which has lots of, potentially lots of characteristics that are not being shown on the graph. Um, have, you, have you seen in your experience, like how, how people address this idea of case versus data point when they have the table and the graph present? So you're saying that a point in a graph you don't quite consider a case because you're just displaying two of its you know, I'm saying I think attributes and I'm saying that my observations in the way people talk about what they are seeing on the graph often seems to indicate that they're not thinking of the point as a case. Oh that they're not thinking of it as a case. Right. Yeah. Um Well, I, I, I think that's true, and certainly with the research we've done that they can be confused, certainly, about what that thing is. Um, e even worse than that, I think, in looking at a graph, students try to make an interpretation of the graph without even trying to clarify what it is. And I, I think experts, most of us who look at a graph and we do, our first step before trying to summarize what we see is saying, wait, wait a minute, what are the elements there? Uh, to us, that's a question is, what is the case? And until you answer that question or clear about it, any kind of statements you make about larger patterns are going to be um, probably wrong. So we certainly see a lot of evidence that students are not uh, often asking themselves the question, what is that? Or often making assumptions unstated and maybe even unclear to themselves about what, that, what those things are. So we do see sort of that understanding of cases as critical also to interpretation of graphs, not just to understand data in a table. Um, so our view of case then really you know, we often talk about modeling in data, and for us, the case is sort of the beginning of the modeling process. Uh, it is already a simplification of some real-world phenomena, um, and uh, an, an alternative description of, of that modeling might be this one, where by in creating cases, we map a real-world phenomena into the data world. And, um, and if we think about this mapping, then we see that a case is not just uh, one level, but two levels removed from a target phenomena. That is, we have some real world phenomena of interest. We then uh, develop an observational process for how to measure or record that, and that gets recorded in a case. So, so a case is, is not the same thing as the target phenomena, and keeping that difference in mind is really, we think, an important part of um, being critical or being able to interpret data. Uh, 
And if we, if we look at experts looking at data, them being able to question sort of, or keep in mind that the case is not identical with the real world thing is a big part of what got, can guide uh, expert exploration during data analysis. Um, when we have when we have cases that have values on multiple attributes, a really critical piece of recording is this issue of binding. Uh, binding by binding, we mean the conventions that one uses to to indicate all of the information that belongs with a particular case. Uh, and as we mentioned, we we develop this traffic scenario to make. Uh, to, and have multiple attributes to make it rather challenging to figure out how to bind this all this information together into cases. Uh, and we expect. Liz, there's a question. Yep. Oh, there's a question from Lee. She asks, "Is it a simplification or an abstraction? Maybe it doesn't matter, but seems to me it's an abstraction, and therefore may be harder for kids." I guess she's referring to is the case a simplification or an abstraction and um, maybe it comes to uh, are we introducing uh, case as a notion for kids and how does it fit into getting kids to understand data? Can we can we uh, propose? Can we add that as a discussion question at the end? That's a pretty profound question. <laughs> yeah, I'll do that. Um, which is another way of saying I don't have a ready answer for that one. <laughs> Good question. Um, Every once in a while, I'm just having a trouble navigating to another screen. Um, that's my problem right now. I'm bound. I'm bound to this screen. Hmm. Any suggestions? Let me escape. Wow. Maybe stop sharing your screen and then start it again. Yeah, I lost my mouse too, so um, even stop sharing has become difficult for me. I see my mouse. You can see my problem, right? Yeah, if you can you wiggle it around, and that makes the mouse big usually, if you keep wiggling it. And then... Wiggling, wiggling here, boss. <laughs> it might be that you it's frozen. Things like that. About uh, escape. Yeah, you hit escape. I hit escape. Uh, more pause sharing. Let me pause sharing and see what happens. I can't find it. I can't get that stop button. Stop sharing. Uh, any more ideas? Um, command option Let me, escape and click. General approaches. Command, command Q to click. There. There you go. Um, let me just see if I can come back into PowerPoint now. PowerPoint stopped, crashed. Yeah, how about command option escape, force quit PowerPoint. I'm going to stop sharing here for a moment. Yeah, I think I need to force quit PowerPoint and start it again. Yeah. I 
inside. Okay. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I got to share my screen again. Zoom. Uh, start sharing. Sorry for that. Well, Cliff is um, uh, getting his screen situated. I'll just share a, a brief side conversation we just had here, um, kind of spinning from this idea of simplification versus abstraction. And just that I think that across different disciplines and um, um, whether it is um, context specific, whether it's in mathematics or science or social studies or whatever, when we talk about kind of modeling, that people might use the term simplification and abstraction to mean very, very different things. And I think that's, I think that's part of the issue of whenever we're trying to then teach kids and then talk to each other as yeah. colleagues. Yeah. Yeah. Of what do we mean by that? We sometimes use a word that we think everybody should Right. Well, in fact, and modeling is a term similarly that's yeah. used so differently it can mean so much that it's uh, um, very hard when one uses that term to really know quite what they're claiming. Right. Um, so back to uh, just back to binding. This is the uh, for those of you who read the article. This is a a. Uh, uh, page of uh, from Philip Ives uh, weather station of uh, weather daily uh, temperature or weather information that he collected uh, and by convention we we know that in such tables that each row uh, is a case and uh, the row is a very common way in tables to kind of bind information together um, a lot of confusion, I think, uh, in fact, comes from the difference between, say, a spreadsheet and a data tool like Fathom or Tinkerplots or others, that in a spreadsheet, uh, rows don't by, don't, by default, bind information together, whereas in data tools, they do. Um, and, that, uh, and people are surprised by that, I think. But, uh, a row is, uh, is, has become a very common way in the data world, anyway, to bind information. Uh, but it's, it's not the only way to do that. Um, here, here is, informa here is a, 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 a data summary from one of our participants that shows sort of what we expected we'd find a lot. That is information that is unbound. So this student has, you know, has got summary information about the segment up here, and then information about three vehicles, uh, there's the speed that they're going and the, the type of vehicle. And then down here, he's recorded the following distances. Um, but the, if, if you went and looked at the original data, the order doesn't match up. So he's got a separate order for that. So this, this is information that is unbound. And when you've got this information and you try to answer some questions about the data, you're going to be rather limited. And again, we, we expected that this would be rather common, uh, especially among middle school students, that we'd find a lot of information that was kind of in separate pieces and unbound. Uh, and to our surprise, there were only eight instances where students developed these sort of unbound uh, data organizations. Uh, a much higher success rate than we anticipated. Um, and in fact, overall, the success rate of students who recorded information in a way that, um, that you could sort of imagine yourself being able to answer all the kind of sophisticated questions you'd like to be able to answer was about 80% of our participants really succeeded by, by the criteria we developed. Uh, and that included 62% of the middle school students. Um, again, we were, we were really kind of surprised by that. Uh, there, there were kind of three types of representations that students used. A very few of them tried to include all of the information in one graph. And in fact, one student succeeded in doing that. Succeeded in making a graph that showed all eight values of attributes in all cases in a single graph. 
and it was kind of mind blowing. Um, a narrative was another type of structure where students would write kind of sentences or clipped sentences uh, to try and capture that information, uh, and then tables. And as you can see, the use of tables kind of increased with age, uh, and the narrative kind of dropped out. Um, here's just an example of, of what we uh, coded as a narrative structure. Uh, you can see that there, it's, that, that it's kind of, it's not, uh, it's, there were some complete, rather complete sentences. These are more clip sentences describing each vehicle, the speed they're going in the following distance. Um, looking at tables, uh, flat tables that truly, you know, single row or, or uh, a row by column data table was in fact not that common. Only, only about a quarter of the tables that people produced, these students, were actual flat tables. And most of these came from the adults or college students. So our sense was that this was a convention that some people had learned over time, but was not the, not the most common type of table. Um, Truly hierarchical tables were also pretty rare. Uh, here's one of them. Only 9% of the tables were, were completely hierarchical. And, and by that I mean that every column is an attribute, is a formal attribute name, and, uh, and every row is a, is a case, but there are cases at lower levels sort of subsumed under a higher one. Um, You know, no, oh, there it goes. Uh, so the most common type of table convention, and it's about 60% of them, were what, what we call tables with headings. So notice that I've kind of got four tables here, uh, but each of those is kind of in a different section uh, with what we termed a heading. And headings are values of attributes. So notice that here, I've got east and west, and it's not really an attribute. That is, I don't have formal lane direction value west, east. I'm sort of just using west and east as labels to, uh, to create subsets of the data. And um, again, th these, this was the most common type of structure uh, used to record this information. Uh, and, and just point out, this is a very efficient way of coding because uh, I only have to write the term, if I put this all in a flat table, I would be writing west however many times there, however many cases there are, I've got to write it east or west. Here I write it once with the understanding, or twice actually west, uh, that all of the values that are spatially included with, uh, in that section inherit that value. So it's a very efficient kind of coding. Would you consider that one a sort of three-level hierarchy, in a sense? Um, yeah, yeah. So it's it's sort of I've it, you know I've got the snapshot information, the time and the segment number. I've got east and west as another level, lane direction, and then within that, I've got vehicle information. So it's kind of a three level uh, so, structure. Cliff, can I ask a quick question? And I had to step out um, for a phone call, I apologize. So you may have said this, but um, when you gave them, uh, all of these people, the task of organizing the data, um, were, they, were they doing it for the purpose of answering a question about about data context, right. what, 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 why, what, what reason were they given to try to organize the data? We told them that city planners were trying to understand traffic in the okay. city, and it, uh, and, and they, and we, um, we didn't want to pose a specific question. You know, they want to understand, you know. Right. What time it was because we in some of our pilot information if as soon as we ask a specific question some students would structure the data to answer that particular question so right. we wanted to kind of leave it vague but assume that most of them would um, 
would understand the kinds of questions you'd want to ask. So we wanted them to record all of the data to kind of answer any question that could come up. Okay. In so the they, interviews, we did ask them what kinds of questions late after they recorded it, their information. We asked them what kinds of questions the, the city planners might have in mind. And all of them were able to uh, come up with two or three or four reasonable kinds of questions. Right, right. I'm just wondering if, if they thought that their task was to, to organize the data in such a way to communicate something to the commissioners, um, not necessarily do something after the data was organized with it. I don't know. I'm yeah, well, and that's something we, you know, and, and certainly when you record data like this, you don't want to be asking uh, if you think you're trying to answer a particular question, you might organize it another level up to try and make the display right. um, communicate a pattern already. So that, that was a, in the instructions, boy, we worked a long time trying to get the materials and instructions uh -huh. at the level that would make it clear that this is the kind of thing you wanted. You don't want to try to answer a question yet. Um, it's, that's a challenging... <laughs> Yeah. I, I know you can, if students weren't real familiar with the situation, I don't think we could have done this, but I think because they kind of have some ready hypotheses even, that, that they can entertain the idea of several questions and not just one. Uh-huh. All right, good, thank you. Um, I just wanted to come back to Ives' uh, table here because this can look like a flat table mostly you know with with attributes and long columns and, and cases and rows but if you look more carefully up here he's got january 85. so rather than recording the month and the year for each case he's actually using headings uh, up at the top uh, so that basically now each page in his book is a month is a different unit Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, these headings, I think we would discover in our own work, we use uh, quite a bit for efficiency of coding uh, and, uh, and understand how they, f how they function spatially. Um, so a hypothesis that we kind of developed as we, 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 as we looked at this data it was that data structures themselves, not just cases, but the structures are actual models. Uh, for at least some students, and not just mere conveniences. Um, and what I mean by that is, is you, you can think of a flat structure as kind of modeling a flat world in which there is just one type of object. So when you, when you create a flat data structure of these vehicles, you really are, let's just think about, that there's only one object in my world, that it's a vehicle, and it's, it's got a direction, it's got a speed, it is on a, a lane at a particular date. Uh, when you create a nested structure, you're actually thinking of the world is involving maybe three types or two types of objects and relations between those, and then spatially indicating. So as, as Dan mentioned in that data sheet, we saw there were kind of three levels of objects and and you can see from this student's uh, data record, the, the way he's sort of putting boxes around objects indicates to us that same thing, that I've got vehicles, that those things are on lanes, a different level of object, and those lanes, and furthermore, I've got sort of time slices in the segment. So I've got three kinds of objects in my world and I'm trying to show the relation between them. So, so I guess our claim is that when we, when we use different data structures, we're actually thinking of the world in a, in a different way. Um, so certainly the choice of a data structure has consequences, benefits and costs. Different structures involve more or less encoding effort. Some are easier to extend with new data than others. Uh, the clarity uh, certainly the functionality of a particular structure when paired with the graphing technology is something important to think about. Um, and we saw lots of evidence in these young students even of uh, understanding some of these implications so they could critique certain choices as being inefficient 
for example, or uh, unclear to somebody else. So some evidence that we have that these different structures involve maybe different kinds of views of the world or models uh, that we found in these interviews or in the, this data set uh, came from the fact that, um, that you can think of direction as either a property of a vehicle, the direction is going, or the property of a lane, you know, an eastbound highway. So I can think of, even when there isn't a vehicle on that, I can uh, assign uh, a direction to a lane without assignment to, to a vehicle. So there were some, certainly some evidence in the interviews that depending on the structure, students talked about lane differently. Um, so here was Paul's data sheet and notice he's, he's sort of used a narrative where he's got uh, what we're calling um, headings so he's got westbound and eastbound uh, and various vehicles on those. So he's kind of used a, two or, or make a, a three level kind of hierarchy to encode the data. So he's got time segments, lanes, and, and within that finding vehicles. Uh, after the, at the end of the interview, we showed uh, students two data sheets um, and asked them to comment on them. And one of them was uh, a hierarchical structure. Uh, so that's a three level hierarchical structure of the data. And the other was a flat data sheet. And then we asked them you know, whether, whether those were okay and uh, which they liked best and just asked them to talk about these representations. Um, and what we found interesting in Paul's cases is the way he talked the way his language changed when he looked at these two. Uh, the first one, which is kind of like the top one there, which is very much like his structure, uh, that is there are three levels. He talks about, well, on these 15 foot lanes, there's one lane and there's five cars on that lane and it's going the direction. So notice in this world, uh, lanes are an object uh, in themselves and they have the attribute or the values east and west that belong to those lanes. When then we showed him the flat structure and he talked about that, look at his language now. Uh, it seems like the individual vehicle, so there's like a date and the time it was photographed or whatever, it being the vehicle. Uh, there's a road number that it was on, the car is now on a road number, uh, and then the direction now becomes a uh, an attribute of the vehicle, the direction it was going, east or west. So that's some evidence for us, at least, that the structure um, really is not just a convenience, it, re it really has uh, uh, influences the, the way one thinks about the world. And one speculation then about why a flat data table is relatively rare is that I think in this situation that it's a little bit easier to think about you know, vehicles and lanes and time segments as being separate things. And a flat table to generate that really requires me to transform the world uh, and think of it in a flat way. No, I'm going to strip it down and give every, every attribute is going to belong to a vehicle, even though more naturally, even though that's a kind of a strange way to think about it. So this really influenced our thinking, I think, this research, and that we had begun thinking that a flat table was more, maybe an easier or more intuitive kind of representation. In fact, we came to see it, at least in complex situations, as really a, a, a rather, maybe we use the word abstract, uh, is a further step away from reality, uh, so more cognitive work to sort of think about the world in that way than in a more nested way. So the major conclusions from this study were that the observation that the students were more likely to create nested data structures than they were to produce a flat table. Uh, and it suggested to us that hierarchical structures, which involve a type of nesting, might be, in fact, more intuitive and easier to work with than even flat tables. Uh, so this, this encouraged us to continue uh, along with our particular plans for uh, CODAP, and uh, I think it's it's uh, proven the case that it's not more, at least more challenging than a flat table. So that's my summary, and these are again my questions, and maybe we can open it up now to more general 
uh, questions or other questions you have about this particular you can stop sharing. So I've got a, I've got a question. This is Holly Lynn um, Lee at NC State, and um, I'm going to also try to open up the, the group chat. Um, so again, maybe I missed something along the way, but how how or why do you think it is that um, you know you, you're, earlier you were talking about that the understanding kind of what a case is, and then moving to this binding of understanding what goes, you know, what, what gets bound with, with an individual case is really the, a very important step in thinking about structuring data. From that, how, what's the transition that's going on where then kids are led to organizing their data, their bound data, hierarchically? Do you have any hypothesis about that? Um, and by hierarchical, do you mean, do you mean yes. just nesting in general? Yes. Um, well, uh, if, if you, I, I think nesting is a pretty, is a convention we use very early on. Um, and, and if you think about even headings in books and texts that we use, uh -huh. that's a type of a nesting, right? I'm going to put the topic up here and everything that comes under that section belongs there, belongs to chapter one. So I think it's a, it's a, that kind of use of a heading is something we, we learn very early on. So I think that's, that's, so it's not a, a novel kind of notion at all to use space and indentation to kind of show belonging. And so do you think in that, would you consider in that last example that you showed of when Paul, I think it was Paul, was talking about the, the two different um, structures of that data, that you were talking about how he, how Elaine was talked about in a different way. Do you think he saw Elaine as a case? Hmm. Or a vehicle as a case? Well, I think his, in, I, I, I would claim in his first, in the way he recorded the data, that he was seeing three levels of objects. And um, so, yeah, I, I think he was seeing lanes as, as cases uh -huh. uh, and, and viewing vehicles as sort of being nested or contained within lanes. Cases contained in that larger case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is uh, Eric Weeby, also in North Carolina State here. I just wanted to uh, respond to Mimi's comment about um, this work reminding her of DeSepsis and Sharon's work around uh, meta-representational competence and sort of the invention of representations. It, I'm reminded again and again, and this presentation certainly reinforces that, is that uh, when you give a, a, a child a piece of paper and a pencil, that they now have a completely, uh, uh, not completely, but a largely unencumbered, at least two-dimensional space in which they can invent a representation. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas when you give them a tool like Tinkerplots or Fathom or Codap or really any kind of software tool, now all of a sudden there is a, a, both a very visible but also implied structure in which that invention can happen and it just highly influences how they go about that sort of invention. And I mean, it really cuts both ways. So we have wonderful opportunity to just cap, scaffold, guide, and support work in those uh, software environments that you can't always do in a freeform environment like a piece of paper, but it also, uh, especially when it works against the grain of, of, of their uh, uh, preconceived notions of how they want to structure that, that data, as you showed with uh, how they thought about cases, um, it really runs into real conflict. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, I'm working on those sort of issues around uh, data representations and block-based programming, how 
programming creates its own sort of uh, structure. I mean, it's a, a space that DeSessa explored with its boxer mm -hmm. uh, programming language, um, and that he pointed out how it can be used very uh, constructively to shape and guide uh, represent, re representation of data. I found the um, this idea that the the structure of the data really shapes their way of talking about it and even their conceptualization of the whole data set very fascinating. Um, one of the things that we did in CODAP to facilitate flexibility along those lines, and Eric, you mentioned how you know it kind of locks you in. Any tool starts to lock you in. Um, we, we um, instituted a kind of table where you can drag and create new hierarchies. And I'm wondering, you know, we haven't done any real studies yet. We've studied how students sort of interpret an existing hierarchy, but we haven't really done any work on looking at what happens as they have some freedom to restructure, or do they take advantage of that freedom to restructure? How much does the initial representation Kind of lock them into a way of thinking about things. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe I could uh, take a moment, Cliff, and uh, illustrate what Dan is talking yeah, about. Yeah, that would okay. be good. Um, and as you're setting up, just just commenting on on what Eric mentioned. That um, I think one of our next. You know, it's, it's one thing to create a structure of your own and students can develop pretty complex things. And it really is a different world when you come in and then you have to um, use a tool. It might have a very, use a very similar structure, but kind of understanding its constraints and limitations is, is puts put students in a very different ball game. Yeah. So, um, for for us, this research was we, we tried to use it. In fact, uh, uh, can we spent a little while thinking? Can we can we create a data structure that really allows students to flexibly uh, enter their data uh, in a way they might you know, on paper and pencil and get them in the end in, in an okay place? And we gave that up. We we couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> And, and one of the reasons, and what, one of the things we tried to do is, let's see if we can create a structure that uses headings. And it, pretty be, it, came, it became clear that there was no way that we could build in any way for the computer to recognize a difference between a heading and an attribute name. And, and really that meant that in order to use that structure, students would have to understand both headings and attribute names and the difference between them which seemed to be uh, to us more complex than simply forcing them to, you know, use attribute names. Right, right. So, um, so it, it, when, when we, that, that took us surprisingly long to actually come to that realization. I'm rather embarrassed, but once we got there saying, boy, this is not gonna go anywhere. That would be a more complex situation than what we've got. Uh, so, um so I'll just uh, briefly uh, illustrate what, what we're talking about in, in CODAP. And I uh, dragged in some uh, data uh, that uh, consists of records of Olympic, uh, uh, Olympic events um, from the year 1920 to nearly the present. And you can see here that uh, the case is a little hard to say what it is. It, it's a country and the number of medals of different types and uh, the year of the Olympics and the location of the Olympics. Uh, so it seems a little strange to uh, have to record it this way. Um, if we make a graph and uh, put the years on the x-axis, um, that doesn't really help us uh, understand what's going on here. Now suppose I wanted to uh, find out the number of gold medals for different countries as a function of year. Well, when I say that, then I can ask myself, well, how many years are there? Let's drag years 
all the way to the left here, which will create another high level in the hierarchy. And now I can see that there are 21 years seeing those 21 points down here. Let's see if I can do it again. So instead of uh, 991 points, I now have uh, just the 21 years. Now I'd like to put the, uh, oh, and actually I can drag location over here too. And notice that uh, the number of cases at this level hasn't changed. So I still have, uh, and now this, these make sense out of cases. This, these are the uh, uh, Olympics at a given year and, and location. And there have been 21 of those. Uh, so then um, I want to talk about countries. And um, let's see, I have the question of where should I put this? If I put it here, now I'm back to 991 cases at that level. And I have something that doesn't really make sense again. But if I drag uh, country all the way over here. Uh, now I've got um, 151 countries, which makes sense. Each country has a uh, uh, a given name, but I want to um, compute the number of gold uh, medals for a given year for a given country. And I can do that, um, uh, or actually let me compute the number of gold medals that each country has won, which isn't what I started to do, but uh, it'll illustrate what I, what I mean by computing a measure of something. So the number uh, the total number of gold, and I'll define that as the sum of gold, and let's see what we get. So we can see that uh, over all the Olympics, the um, United States has won 700 gold, and um, and so on. So uh, I haven't done a very good job of this, but uh, I've illustrated the way in CODAP that you can uh, restructure the data to have uh, more levels and uh, that you can compute um, summary values um, uh, at the higher levels that are based on the values at the lower levels. And I'll stop there before I dig, dig the hole deeper. Uh, an interesting thing is how frequently um, we get confused about what we want where and how important it is that we're able to drag things um, to different places and uh, find out uh, the effect of that. Did that muddy the waters sufficiently, Cliff? Um, well, I think it demonstrated what Dan sort of said. That, um, this is a powerful capability, but um, we haven't done a lot of research yet to see whether students can make sensible use of it, but have only observed how confused we can get trying to use it. Right. That gives us some indication uh, that that's not going to be... Um, it, it, It's a high level skill to sort of restructure data in ways that make sense and not get yourself into deep trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that that, you know, that particular data set um, lends itself to potential different ways of meaningfully or not meaningfully um, you know, reorganizing the table of data into different nested structures. But other types of data sets might not lead to much illumination at all. Right. They're not that different than what might one see from the data by just graphing it. And um, 
you know, having it having an attribute be used as a category to see things as different groups. So sometimes I think um, what we I, I think is an important aspect of future research is thinking about um, the usefulness or not usefulness of how students might restructure data in a table um, given different characteristics of a data set. Mm -hmm. I, I will say that I, I have just a very limited experience putting um, CODAP in front of AP statistics students. And even after um, I showed them how they could um, reorganize the table of data, um, as far as I know, and we only screencasted a couple of the computers, but we were walking around the room. I don't think anybody reorganized the data. So even though we showed them different ways that we could do it, they all kept it flat and wanted to explore the data graphically. And I think a challenge too is knowing like how the different attributes relate. So I was trying what before um, Bill was demonstrating this, I was I just pulled like the mammal data set up and was trying to show Eric what was going on. And I was actually choosing variables in the hierarchy that I didn't necessarily know what, what it would show, uh -huh. and it didn't necessarily give me, I think, any more information, like in Hollywood said, if I had just opened a graph up. So I had to know something more about the context and then about how those attributes relate to one another in order to use the table in a way that would give me information that would make sense. Um, and I wasn't able to do that very quickly without exploring you know, the data set. But I, I just think it's great examples of sort of the, the multiple facets of data science literacy and that, uh, you know, visualizing a data set as is, is one, one capacity we want students to have, but this sort of exploration where you, in fact, restructure the data in which we say tabular form right. is, is a whole other skill mm -hmm. set for which, for sure, high school students have little or no experience with. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can... I can imagine a task, though, where students were given a data set and really said, look, figure out how to structure this uh, in a way that makes sense to you and be prepared to argue why, what questions you can answer structured this way that you couldn't get at before, where they really focus and explore that. And, and I can imagine sort of put in that space them sort of you know, if they see this as something that's going to require a lot of thought and maybe 30 minutes or so, it's not a quick move, right. here you go. It's a really challenging task and when you have to defend. And we approach graphing like that. So I can, you know, make a graph that and defend it for answering this particular question. So make a structure and defend it for answering these sorts of questions. I, I can imagine that could be even uh, an interesting task for students. It is, so I'm going to probably show a little bit of naivety here, but in the in the world of um, you know big data, when you are sharing CSV files, don't they typically import in a flat structure? Can you share CSV files that are in a nested structure? I don't think so. I didn't think so either. So. I mean, it depends on the data set. So sometimes we actually receive the data set as a database, uh, which can which have, can. so it could be like a, a relational uh, database, at which point uh -huh. you then can uh, either probe that directly, you know, so you can have programmable tools, or, you know, with, with SQL calls, you can explore it directly, or you can do a whole series of flat File exports, which you can work on further. Mm -hmm. Does that make, make sense? What else might you need? And, and of course, um, what's great about CODAP is that you take such a flat file and you can quickly make it hierarchical. Right, right. But, but I think the point is, is that even with CODAP, even though you can restructure it, when it comes in, it's flat. It's flat. And so, um, and if you export it, it exports flat. A, a thing to point out, though, is that with in in practice, when we're using CODAP with 
with learners, uh, we're usually uh, giving them a document that has some data in it. And the author of the document gets to choose uh, how to present that data. And the, the research that we um, have undertaken subsequent to the, um, the research that Cliff is talking about today has been to look at uh, how do students make sense of a CODAP document that has a three-level hierarchy data structure and graphs of data at different levels. Mm -hmm. And um, that, um, that research would be worth another seminar, actually, another webinar. Well, I, I also wanted to go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, but I, you know, thinking about my current task at hand to prepare materials to teach teachers how to use CODAP. Well, if teachers are going to prepare CODAP files, they need to understand it. It you know, it inputs the input is flat, the outputs are flat, and then you've got as a teacher, you've yeah. got to figure out how to restructure that. So yeah, I mean, my gut feeling is that in the K twelve space that flat files offer more than enough space for exploration for learning for students. Uh, and the key is having enough uh, uh, variables to work with right. that, mm -hmm. that you can you can do interesting things with that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to point out that um, this research that Cliff is reporting on um, is an, an example of what I think we will come to call data science education research. That is, it's research about the way students think about data that is a bit different than the than uh, research that uh, traditionally has been conducted in statistics education research. Um, and uh, certainly there's ambiguity about where research belongs, but I think we will need to understand more and more as time goes along, how do students, learners, um, view data, and uh, how do they understand the process of working with data that uh, brings up um, ways of learning that are not traditionally part of what we think about learning statistics. And you know, and part, part of the research questions that we have in our current grant um, bill is wanting to know the nature of the CODAP enabled tasks that teachers do develop to use with students. And I think part of that in that is going to be us really trying to tease out how do they structure the data? How do they, how do these teachers structure the data to choose, choose to structure the data to give to their students? And, and preliminary to that, do they choose to restructure a flat data set? Right. Do they right, see the opportunities uh, that are, are present in having um, more than one level? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Cliff, do you want to go back to some of the questions that came up earlier? Uh, we could uh, make sure somebody else doesn't want to jump in here with uh, with a question. And if I, I've just started to read what people have chatted here. Those chats have also been copied into the Google Doc. And I would be interested not just in questions, but people's reactions. Is, are these ideas, uh, uh, did they make you think differently than you have thought? Um, do you think that they will have bearing on materials that we develop in data science education? What kind of bearing?
So I think it'd be useful to go back to uh, Lee's question. Lee had to leave, unfortunately, but uh, she was, I think, asking, is a case a simplification or an abstraction? Maybe it doesn't matter to me if it's an abstraction and therefore maybe harder for kids. And so maybe she's asking about how does this affect the way we uh, talk about data in the classroom situation. Um, the uh, North Carolina group had a little side conversation about that, and not that we came to any sort of major revelations, but just uh, just the difficulties about uh, using this sort of terminology with students that, that really don't have much experience with sort of uh, talking data science talk, and so. When does simplification, for instance, to a student mean uh, thinning the data set? When does it mean uh, perhaps uh, uh, loosening the, the precision in which uh, data is uh, recorded or visualized? Uh, when does it actually mean some form of re-representation or what I might call abstraction? Uh, uh, and are all those things modeling activities or only the representation or what? I think it potentially also comes back to the question I had earlier about the data point on the graph versus what's a case, that kind of abstraction. I, 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 you know, one of the things that I, I really liked about Kodak when I first encountered it was the animation of representations in t from where they are to where they move to once you change the sort of confining axes or things like that. So this idea that the same quote data point, which is really a case, well, this is how we represent them in a graph that's bound by these constraints. But if we change the, the, rep the things that we want to represent to these other characteristic properties of the case, then the whole things can kind of rearrange and move into those positions. This idea of trying to reinforce the idea that it's more than just uh, an X, Y value or something like that, or, or the representation of a single attribute when you have a, a point on a graph. Yeah, for me, I, I, the, the, um, the power of that and the objective kind of is to make data Kind of behave and look like real objects themselves. So, you know, uh, uh, we, we've seen examples of where kids, you know, make graphs out of themselves, you know, line up by height. So they're really there as part of the living graph. And there's a way in which you can think about the way we use points in, uh, in CODAP in the same way. Look, these are real objects and let's get them to all line up according to value. And, um, and I think that in, invites or it helps in many cases the students to sort of think about the real world object that those things are representing. That, uh, and hopefully to ask themselves, what in the real world does this thing point to? So for me, I, I, I'm, I'm landing more on the simplification in that I think that's the important thing for students to realize is that this, that this rendering in a case is a simplification of the real world object. And I, uh, at various times, have to reconsider in thinking of the data, wait a minute, I'm not actually looking at heights. These have been recorded and are subject to error. And, uh, and I have to think about them differently. So I'm more on the side of thinking of these things as simplifications than as abstractions ordinarily. I would agree with that. Um, we have to call the data something. And, and lots of terms get introduced or, uh, ad hoc or formally. Um, let's call them rows or let's call them points or items or records. And uh, over time, I've come to really like the term case 
and the uh, instances that I've had to use that in a learning situation with other people, it has worked pretty well. And to amplify what Dan was talking about, the graphs and the points, being able to ask the question, what's the case represented by this point in this graph is, is one of the most useful uh, questions uh, to ask uh, someone when you want to gauge how well or poorly they're understanding what the data are. Right. Yep. And I think this particularly um, connects with uh, oftentimes I'll, I'll have students either by hand or on the computer, they're collecting some measure from a sample and then they're graphing the collection of those measures, and I know many of you have done the same type of activity. So you have an empirical sampling distribution. You may not call it that when you're first working with students. And, and then when you ask them, well, what does each of these dots mean? What is, that a, what is that a case of? And that tells you tons about what they understand about what they just, what, what they're actually looking at. Um, but I, I think that what this also makes me think about with our work in trying to create a sampler and how to represent data um, as an output from a sampling process and whether or not, and the, what makes me think about this also is the output from the data games um, that you were showing earlier. It's, it seems like the data is, is being pre-structured in a nested format. And what I wonder is, can it be unnested? So in the data games output of the table, can somebody, can somebody take that and unnest it? And then um, in a sampling process, should we also allow that same kind of thing? That we want to be consistent in the way that we allow students access to um, structuring and unstructuring data. So it's interesting that you, you can, oh, go ahead, Dan. Uh, I was going to say, I, I had an interesting instance of this particular thing yesterday. I was working with a colleague, and, and he, we were looking at some data that he had generated, and there was this one data point, I'll say, you know, I'm thinking about this terminology, on the graph that looked odd. And he's like, I don't know what's going on here. And I, he was doing the analysis and caught up. I said, well, click on that point. And he clicked on that point and it brings up the row in the table and the entire row is highlighted. So it's like, oh, this point represents all of this stuff that's going on. I can now connect like a particular conundrum I'm having and interpreting a, a specific attribute in that row. Like what else is happening? That might, or even not just a single row, but before and after, because this this was collecting data of a physical process. Right. You know, that's going on here, and I found that really interesting. Like when I showed that to him, it was sort of a revelation. Like, oh, I can do that. I can see like my the graph is going to help me not only look see that I have this one outlier in this one particular attribute of measuring, but it can help me contextualize it by putting by showing me the case that this point belongs to. Right, right. And one of the things that related to that, Dan, that we found, and this was also in a paper that was um, published in CERB a couple of years ago, that when the teachers that we were working with um, did such moves where they highlighted a specific case and they were able to see that um, case over in the, the table, it led to further data, data exploration because then they now saw something that, that case was interesting to them for some reason, or cases, it might be a collection of, of data points that they highlighted. And then that led to kind of this further data, like, like a more refined question came up. And they're like, oh wait, I want to explore this a little bit further because in the, in the table, I noticed that, you know, those that had this certain attribute that made them interested in this graph, there seems to be something going on here that I want to explore further. So I agree with you that that, representation linking um, at the case level um, is extremely important. Yeah, let me uh, make a connection to some of the work we're doing on the scientific modeling side. So kind of modeling we're doing is, uh, is uh, agent-based modeling. 
So we, like you, we have these sort of represented entities on the screen, and those represented entities all have uh, states associated with them, and I think we could make a close parallel between what we're referring to as states and we're referring to as the case. So say we just did this, uh, built this epidemic uh, activity. So each entity in our simulation was a, a person and that person would have state characteristics like are they male or female, are they healthy, are they sick, uh, uh, age, uh, you name it. So we have all this sort of data associated with that. Uh, the difference, and I think maybe what takes us from maybe from a model to a simulation, is we also have rules associated with that, that case or that entity that says right. when this thing interacts with other things out there, it does, are the rules yeah. by which it, uh, it acts. But, uh, in, you know, in as much as the empirical data is capturing the state of all those entities at a particular point in time in the simulation, that sort of time slice extracted, there is a nice uh, tie between that uh, simulation as it plays out over time and the data table generated either from all the states at a particular point in time or over multiple slices. Mm -hmm. of time. So. Well, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, um, Bill was sort of talking about the follow-up research that we did. That maybe someone could present uh, uh, at another time. But we uh, presented students with data in uh, about fast plants um, that were hierarchically structured in CODAP, and they had two graphs. One, one where the cases were the, uh, the daily growths of all of the plants. So there were hundreds of cases. And another graph where it was just information about the individual plants. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and then basically tried to, tried to see what they understood from these two graphs. Uh, and most of them experienced some difficulty and confusion. You know, the basic question, well, why are there only 10 points in this graph and 160 in this one. And, uh, and it was linking, clicking on, and seeing the relationship between the graphs and the tables uh, and the highlighting that allowed most of them to finally make sense of that. So that uh, and that's a spatial relationship that's available in, in some tools that is not generally available. So some of these students had to be, didn't discover linking on their own. They kind of had to be shown, but once they discovered it or were shown it, they could finally piece together the meaning. Uh, so I think that just, I think reinforces what Dan was saying, what others are saying, the importance of uh, getting students to sort of click on and explore relations between table, data in the table and data in the graphs. That, it's those two things linked together that, uh, at least if they haven't collected the data themselves, uh, helps them. I would think it would be different if the students had collected the data themselves. Uh, that, that structure and those relations might be much more available to them much sooner. But again, in the, I think the world that we're moving in big data, it's going to be almost always the case that we're looking at data that we haven't collected ourselves and we're, our first step is trying to understand what in the world we're looking at. I'll just, <clears throat> I'll just put up that um, Fast Plants uh, document just for a moment. So here you can see the um, three levels, the measurements of the plant, plants, the actual plants, and then uh, whether the plants were grown in sun or shade. And students made um, a lot of use of selection in the process of understanding what these um, 
levels what the cases were, uh, but for for many students, they had to be prompted to click before they did it. Um, and uh, but once they learned how that this was possible, then they started using uh, clicking in the uh, different representations to uh, understand what's going on at uh, in in the other graphs and the, and the table. Um, just just a very really interesting result is that uh, looking at the, the graph on the lower left that a lot of students could make what sounded like sensible interpretations of that graph when in fact they didn't understand what the cases were. So, you know, things they could say, well, they, they, the, the plants tend to be growing and getting taller over time. But they didn't quite understand what they were looking at. You can sort of make that statement just because the values are increasing. Um, and it was really remarkable yeah. how it, how students were able to kind of carefully say sensible like things with a minimum of understanding. Yeah, so one of the ambiguities that would arise in the interview was uh, how many plants are there looking at this graph? And uh, it would become, uh, the students would be confused and they'd say, well, each point is a plant. And then we as researchers would become confused about what they meant by that. Um, did they mean that uh, there, there were plants, there were many, many plants each grown for a certain number of days and then their height measured? Or did they see a continuity um, that this, this uh, curve represents one plant? Um, and in, 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 in our prior flat days of data, students would have only been looking at that graph. Uh, they couldn't have made the graph on the, on the right in the flat space. And at least there's a way in which we think being able to make these two graphs actually introduces a problematic to students that can lead to better understanding that they couldn't get from that flat world. It, it really leads to a confusion that gets them, some of them to ask the right question, wait, wait a minute, what are these things over here? Uh, and how are they different? They, they aren't plants, because here are plants, 10 of them, what are those? Um, another, I think, nice feature for me, and uh, I don't think we've seen this, evidence for this, but we've got a lot of research to indicate that that students don't think about, so many students don't interpret statistics, say means, as, as attributes that belong to the collection as a whole. They can give interpretations to means even that seem like they're, they're talking about values of individuals. And what's nice in the hierarchy is that you can, if you go and compute a mean uh, of a group, you can put that mean up at the higher level in the hierarchy um, and in a way associate the mean with, with the group as a whole and not with any individual in it. Um, again, we haven't done research, but I think there's an interesting line of research about students' interpretation of means when used in a flat world versus a hierarchical world where you can, where you can associate them with the aggregate object rather than the so you can compute the mean height, say final height, in this data set of the sun versus shade and have just two values and realize, gee, that's a, that's a value that applies to the group as a whole and not to the individuals. I, I don't know if I made sense there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do, and, and, and I think what's interesting is that um, I think that so I'm, I'm only going to specifically talk about kind of tinker plots and fathom, but I think um, many users of those tools had really kind of transitioned to that the collection, even though you might create some attributes from other attributes within a collection, that the collection 
was not a place that you computed, that it was not a place where you actually explored, you know, um, the measures of different um, different kind of characteristics in that data set. You did that in other objects. You did that in a summary table. You did that in a graph mm. uh, window. And so um, transitioning to that the data table is not um, is not this uh, untouchable object. That this is something that you structure and restructure and that you compute within it. Um, I think is a very different mindset. Because even yeah. when, you, when you have data in Excel, you might be you might be computing things in the same sheet as your data lives over to the right, but or down below the data, but you don't have a sense that you're fundamentally changing the representation of the data. I was just gonna point that out that in, in, in there's a little bit of a I don't know if I would call it a weakness, but it's it's not something that I think the CODAT table supports well in terms of someone just saying, for example, Bill, you you showed the the um, the Olympic medal data. But what if someone just wanted to know how many total Olympic medals did we have? Well, I guess they could have um, made a new hierarchical level and then just put in the total there, but sort of feels it feels odd to say I'm creating a new hierarchical level just to calculate a sum over everything that's at the child level. Mm -hmm. um, and in the spreadsheet, you would just put it at the bottom or over on the right or something like that. So we don't have a way in CODEP of supporting sort of quick summary statistics about stuff that's there without changing the hierarchy or adding to them. Right. Yeah, I agree. I think that uh, remains an unsolved design problem in, in CODAP. Um, I was going to amplify what uh, Holly Lynn was saying about the case table. In the in the days of Fathom and Tinkerplots, uh, the table was something, it was like a necessary evil. Um, I needed it to get the data in and um, to look at individual values, but mostly I kicked I would either close the table or make it small and use graphs for exploring the data. But uh, in CODEP with the ability to restructure, the table actually becomes fun and interesting um, and uh, a, a, a much more of a tool for exploration than, uh, than, it, than tables felt previously, at least to me. Right, so it's redefining exploratory data analysis. Yes. Yeah, um, it the table does push uh, a bit on our notion of case. By the way, that you know, as soon as you create this upper level, like we did with the plants of sun, wait a minute, so the condition sun is a case. Yeah. In, in what sense did I is that a um, a record of a repeatable observational process? So, in fact, but, st but statistically, that gets at what if I wanted to create a model of comparing two groups, two conditions. Yeah, it does. Right. So I can drag anything up there. I can drag male and female up there as a group and look at it. And now I'm thinking of male as a case. There's a situation where I think the case is, has become very abstract. Right. Not something I can point to quite in the real world as a physical object. It's a real construction. Right. And that, I think, is what can lead to some real confusion when you start operating or creating cases at that level. Right. So I wonder if, if, if it's that we need to talk about things at those higher levels not as cases but as groups. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of function in talking and trying to conceive them as a case in the way we define them. Yeah. Well, but then you're stuck with saying these rows are cases, but when no. you get up here, these rows are not cases. They're groups. Well, I can certainly, I, I've, in, in most situations, I can 
I can tell myself a fairly complicated story of how I can view them as a case. So I can, right. I can but well, we, it's a very have, complicated story. But we also have to do this in qualitative data analysis all the time mm -hmm. of defining kind of what you're, you know, if you're doing a case study, you know, the, the question I ask my students all the time is, well, what is your case? You know, your case isn't always an individual. Right. You know, your case could be, you know, the school, a, a, the school the teachers, or, you know, yeah. Well, there's where, you know, the term sort of unit of analysis can, exactly. can be a little bit better than case because you don't yeah. find yourself asking the same concrete question when you say, what's your unit of analysis? That's right. And does analysis take the place of observation? Yeah, I think that so. Instead of unit of observation, observation unit of analysis. Of term. But what's, what's different there is that, you know, Often I haven't, this isn't the, I create a level that I haven't really observed at. It's a created level and there's a way in which unit of analysis kind of is a more interesting way to think about it. Mm -hmm. But I, I think of sun and shade as observations. Like I do this whole thing and that was my sun case. And now I'm doing one of... Yeah, that's the story I can tell myself, Bill. That where, uh, I see. Where it makes sense. You could do that with groups. You can imagine that you collected the data about one group, and then you go and went and repeated that set of observations on another group, even though you didn't collect the data that way. You could have. Right. And there's a way in which, when you analyze the data, that's the way you want to think about it. That's the unit, and I want to repeat it over here. Um, by the way, I, I don't think that students need to understand case at the level we've been talking about it to make perfect sense of data. <laughs> um, it's a very, when, when we try to ask the question, what does this point in the graph represent or point to? That's a hard question to even pose in, in a sensible way. Yeah, and I think one of the things we need to probably tease out is when is it important and when is it not? And um, you know, thinking about in the data science world and thinking about levels of kind of sophistication, when, when does really understanding what a case is have to come into play? Mm -hmm. So we're coming up on the end of our webinar. Uh, Talia, did you want to say anything in preparation for finishing? Uh, sure. Are you ready for that now, Bill, or would you like to offer just a little bit of a discussion question? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. I said, would you like to do that now, or would you like to wait uh, for just a little bit more time for discussion questions? Um, so I was under the impression we were stopping at uh, 10 minutes before the hour. Okay, great. Um, I think that now is a good time to go ahead with that then. Um, okay, well, thank you very much, Cliff. Uh, I had a really terrific time, and I hope that everybody else did. Thank you for joining us today. If you did not get to your question, or you'd like to leave additional discussion questions or anything in the Google Doc that we shared, We'll email you tomorrow and get you an answer. I think that we had a lot of great interaction and I'm grateful to all of you for making this really rich discussion happen too. Uh, we'll send you a link to the recorded session shortly. Also, if you enjoyed this webinar and you'd like to attend future data science education webinars, Holly Lynn Stoli of NCSU will be our host on June 19th. You can sign up at concord.org slash meetup. You can also stay connected with us by following us on Twitter. And it, we are at Kodap DataSci. If you use the hashtag DataSciEd to tweet us any additional questions or resources, we'll be happy to respond to you. Also, feel free to visit our website, kodap.concord.org, and you can connect with us there as well. Um, again, thank you everybody very much, and uh, Cliff, especially thank you to you for hosting our first webinar. Thanks for having me.
Thank you, Cliff. Thank you. Good to see you all. Thanks, Cliff. Thanks, Thanks Cliff. Um, so the, that you'll give me instructions about how to get that recording to you? Yes, that would be great. Um, question for you, Cliff. Are you familiar with um, the CyberDuck uh, yep. SSL? I think that might be the best way to share it. And then um, I'll work with uh, our IT person, Ryan, to do the rest of it. Okay. I could also post it. I've got a Dropbox thing I can put it in. Oh, yeah. Dropbox is fine, too, if that's easier for you. All right. And where, where is the recording yeah. stored? Um, you'll see it on your computer. Um, here, I'll share my screen and you can kind of see what it will look like. Um, it's on the desktop probably or it's down? Yeah. So are you on a Mac or a PC clip? No, Mac. Okay. Um, I'll just show you what I typically do. Um, so if you're here in all my files, I usually just search for Zoom like this. Oh, okay. And it usually comes up. If it doesn't, maybe try Zoom. Yeah, with a. Um, let's see. Let's, I'm not doing a good job demonstrating this. I apologize. Um. It's probably uh, Zoom folder at the bottom. And then Zoom here, it okay. should be forward. Okay, I'll find yeah. it and I'll post it in Dropbox. Perfect, thank you, Cliff. Thanks. Thank you very much, you did a wonderful job hosting. Thanks. So how, how was it for you, Cliff? Uh, good. Uh, interesting group as always. Yeah, uh -huh. very likely. I felt really bad about my example. I shouldn't oh, have used good. the Olympic medals. That, that was uh, that was good. I think it, uh, for people who hadn't seen that before, I think that was a good introduction of the power of that. And I think uh -huh. I encountered a bug while I was doing it. Okay, see you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.